All right. Go ahead. All right. Welcome. Benvenu. Benvenuto. This session is being recorded. Audience members will be muted at any time during the presentation. Please enter your or type your questions into this for the speakers in the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. Audience members will be muted at any time during the presentation. Please type your question. Oh, excuse me. Um, this event is the first live film discussion of the 2021 Sacramento Jewish Film Festival. It is sponsored by the Jewish Federation of the Sacramento Region and the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Sacramento Region. I am Christine, who will be your moderator for this afternoon session. I want to thank the many festival sponsors and advertisers who are listed on the festival website. Please patronize our business sponsors. I would be remiss if I did not recognize our dynamic festival director, Tevin, and all the festival volunteers, including Sherry, who is receiving the questions that audience members type in the chat box, and technical assistance from Mary, who admitted you to this chat. Speaking of technical assistance, we can thank the folks at Elevant for their help. Last but not least, I want to thank the Sacramento Italian Cultural Society and the Italian Cultural Institute of San Francisco for co-presenting the Modigliani film. For you Italian aficionados, check out the other Italian film at the festival, A Starry Sky Above the Roman Ghetto, that the Sacramento Italian Cultural Society is also co-presenting. Much as we are all going, much as we all miss the movie theaters and live performances, this year's Sacramento Jewish Film Festival is virtual to assure your safety. The pandemic has given us access to films that in other times might have been slated for art house theaters. The pandemic has also permitted experts from thousands of miles away to join us. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing our two distinguished guests who are joining us from their homes in New York. Dr. Ken Wayne founded the Modigliani Project in 2013 to research and chronicle the art and life of Amadeo. Amadeo. Amadeo, thank you, Modigliani, to promote scholarship and secure the artist's legacy for posterity. Ken is an established art historian, curator, and museum professional. He has studied Modigliani for more than 30 years. As the Modigliani's project president, Ken oversees research and scholarship projects, the advisory council's activities, and the catalog raisonné. Dr. Clemence Bouluk is a professor in Jewish and Israeli studies at Columbia University. Prior to her academic career, Clemence worked as a literary and movie critic in Paris. She is a published novelist and essayist in her native France. Her latest book, Another Modernity, Elia Benamosen's Jewish Universalism, has just come out. Her new project deals with the significance of the Kabbalah in the 20th century art and culture, with a specific emphasis on Modigliani's and Jewish mysticism. For more biographical details, including our speaker's numerous academic degrees, see the, their biographies in the special events section of the festival's website. Clemence will set the stage and describe Modigliani's early years in Livorno, Italy. Then Ken will transport us to Paris in the early 1900s when Modigliani was most productive. Following their presentations, Clemence and Ken will respond to audience questions. We'll conclude with closing statements. Clemence. Well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, again, it is one of the uh, blessings in disguise of this um, uh, really challenging times to be able to join you today from New York. 
Um, thank you for to um, to the organizers uh, for what is really looking like it's going to be a wonderful festival, uh, and I can't wait to uh, you know immerse myself in all the movies that are um, offered. Um, so I will start out by uh, giving you a little bit of a um, of a landscape uh, of Modigliani's um, early years, and obviously the term landscape is. Uh, no pun intended, but I do think that uh, he, it is really important to understand the role that Livorno, um, his birthplace, uh, played in his work. Um, because of the history of the place, because of the specificity of the place, but also because of a specific figure, uh, a rabbi called Elia Benamozek that I uh, worked on, who oversaw Modigliani's bar mitzvah and whose uh, understanding of Judaism made an impression on Modigliani's work and even on his brother's work. Uh, that's something that I'll uh, talk about later. Uh, his brother was not an artist, he was a politician, uh, but I think that this understanding of Judaism as something which is universal and which which has something to uh, teach the world um, is, is extremely important. So let's go to Livorno first. Um, Livorno's uh, specificity is that it is it was a free port city that was created by the Grand Dukes of uh, the, the Medici, the Grand Dukes of Tuscany, uh, with charters that were promulgated in the 16th century, late 16th century, um, 1591, 1593. Um, you don't need to know all the details uh, about those charters, but suffice it to say that what they um, did is that they extended privileges to residents of any nation, um, you know, Portuguese, Greeks, Persian, and Jews. Jews were uh, considered a, a nation, and that granted the rights to have uh, free and public religious practice as well as a protection uh, for religious minorities from excessive taxation, from the inquisition, um, and from any kind of violence or discrimination. So the rationale uh, was to attract Sephardic diaspora um, that, and the, the motivation was not just, you know, pure philo-Semitism uh, as much as, we, as we, we'd like to uh, imagine, but it's just a perception that Sephardic Jews controlled commerce with the Ottoman Empire. And so the Medici had a vested interest in making sure that their commercial um, um, power uh, would be unmatched. Um, and so those rights uh, actually explained and remained unmatched uh, on the continent, even in the rest of Tuscany. So for instance, you did have an inquisition in Florence, which is really uh, 30 miles away from uh, Livorno, uh, but the, the Livorno Jews were uh, sheltered. So um, there is also another aspect which is really worth mentioning is that there was never a ghetto in Livorno. So the idea is that uh, both econ economic growth and the fortunes of the city created a place that was very cosmopolitan. And so even some of the, the advocates of Jewish emancipation, Jewish assimilation um, in England use Livorno as a, as a model, a place in which, you know, through religious freedom, um, some the, 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 the spirit and, the, and intellectuals, um, intellectual pursuits could uh, thrive. And indeed, Livorno became a, a, a hub for the, the uh, free presses. It was a point of passage for a number of temporary residents. That created something which was really colorful. So even uh, around the time of, of, of um, uh, Modigliani's uh, birth, a, a very noted scholar uh, described his uh, stay in Livorno and said, the various forms of dress afforded an interesting spectacle to the observer. There were European Jews in overcoats, Berbers in their bright white burnous, Orientals in turbans, and many others beside. So the idea that there is something which is, you know, cosmopolitan uh, that is um, that is actually makes space for interreligious dialogue because there was no uh, ghetto. There was also the possibility of speaking, uh, you know, to Christians having those. Um, uh, conversations uh, was very notable. I mean, it's not New York in the 21st century, for sure. Uh, it's not the same kind of integration, maybe uh, for lay people, but at least there was this kind of elite that was um, that that stood for something which was, uh, you know, freedom of spirits and 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 the arts. Um, 
so uh, there is another interesting aspect in that in that narrative, and that's this commercial hub, um, this this place in which merchants would meet, explains why Livorno was connected uh, with uh, the um, with the rest of the world. So basically, uh, Modigliani's grandfather came from Marseille, and this is exactly the kind of um, of interaction that people would have. Uh, that you know, it was connecting. Uh, um, Livorno to the rest of the world. So this is really the kind of environment in which uh, the sort of the, the, the unconscious of the sea was, was happening. Um, there was also a story, and it's a story of, of becoming, going from the uh, center to the margin. There was an economic decline that also explains why um, Modigliani's family went bankrupt. We know that on the father's side, uh, the fortunes of the business were not so great. And that Livorno progressively uh, was uh, sort of on the margins of, of uh, Europe. And the idea of being in the margins, but really trying to, I mean, dreaming of Paris, for instance, in Livorno's case, um, is really, uh, is, is important. That explains why, you know, after spending time in Florence and like studying other places, uh, Modigliani set his sights on, on, on Paris as did many other artists at the time. Uh, and that was also easier since his grandfather was French, his mother taught French, she had a school that she set up and uh, teaching French. And so there is this idea of, you know, Livorno is also a springboard to uh, something else. Um, so that is, that is the, the cosmopolitan Livorno. The other aspect that is really important is that figure that I mentioned earlier, that Rabbi Benamosek. So Modigliani's family was Jewish. Um, the Jewish life in Livorno was this kind of, uh, it was orthodox, but also it made space for people to not go to synagogue. So mostly, you know, Yom Kippur Jews were really uh, the sort of uh, Jews that you'd find in Livorno. Um, but there was also something very specific about this place, and that is explained because of all the, um, the networks uh, with the rest of the Mediterranean, uh, and that's an interest in mysticism. So Livorno was a, a hub for Kabbalah. And one of those figures in the 19th century uh, that really tried to promote Kabbalah as um, a uh, something which is more than uh, Jewish mysticism, that's something that can teach um, the unconscious uh, religion to the world. So the idea is that Kabbalah has this, I uh, mean, you know, it's, it's grounded in Jewish theology, but it also captures a collective unconscious. There is a sort of myth-making aspect to Kabbalah, which is not like the Kabbalah Center, right? It's not like kind of blurry uh, concepts, but the, the, the possibility of capturing a collective unconscious. And that you see resurface a few years later in Modigliani's work. He even writes what I'm looking for is the, um, is the unconscious of the race. That seemed to be completely pulled from the work of Ben Amosek, who incidentally, or not so incidentally, was a rabbi who uh, supervised his bar mitzvah. Uh, so uh, Modigliani was bar mitzvahed in um, the summer of 1897. I, I tried to reconnect um, the, uh, the date, and so that would have been the parasha uh, Pinchas. Um, so there is no real symbolism to this parasha, but, uh, but this is documented. And the importance of Jewish mysticism is also um, uh, visible in some of the, um, uh, the early correspondence that he had with a friend of his called Oscar Gilia, where he talks about uh, uh, his desire to look for um, a metaphysical architecture of the world, which is also something that you can see as being part of uh, a, a Kabbalistic understanding of, you know, the world is built on letters, on the, on the letters of the Bible, and there is this kind of architecture that you can sort of try to reach with uh, proper studies. Uh, another aspect that, he, another uh, quote that seems also very Kabbalistic infused, inflected, uh, is this desire to um, go to, to come back from a garden of, of Eden, basically a mystical garden. That's also something that scholars of Kabbalah would identify as uh, a real Kabbalistic statement. And so what, what is, and that, this is sort of um, 
ushering in uh, Kenneth talk, um, he had this Livornian's identity, this idea that Ju Judaism was universal. When you look at his, um, at his um, um, especially the sculptures, but the masks, there is something which is uh, very specific, but also uses all kind of features. Uh, you know, people said that it was uh, uh, influenced by primitivism, or but there is also something that's trying to capture the essence of, of humanity, which you know is really important in Kabbalah, like the primordial uh, Adam, the first man uh, to whom God you know imparted his knowledge, is also one of the key figures of, of Kabbalah, and so. When he, when he went to Paris, he discovered this new, um, there was this kind of uh, fascination for mysticism, for spiritual, spiritism, you had those sessions. Um, and, and he sort of looked at it, uh, not, I mean, we, we can't say that he was amused or uh, with contempt, but he was more rooted, that the, the sort of the amalgamation, amalgamation of, of by people who didn't know their uh, the scriptures so well is something that he stayed at a, at a distance from. And even though he was exposed and he was immersed in um, you know milieu uh, with people like Max Jacob and all his friends were sort of dabbling in um, those kind of spiritualism uh, sessions. Uh, but that's something that never really permeated uh, Modigliani's work. Um, so I'm just going to, I think I'm uh, running out of time. So I'll just uh, hand it over to Ken and I'm really happy to answer uh, any questions you might have, um, you know, both on Livorno or, um, or anything Modigliani related. Okay. Um, so let's see. So yes, uh, so Modigliani uh, comes from Livorno, a port town. Uh, very cosmopolitan, very sophisticated. Even actually when I visited um, 20 some odd years ago for the first time, uh, and I went to the market there, the open market, there were a lot of things being sold from, from all over the Mediterranean. And that struck me as, uh, as a sign, uh, you know, as a lasting sign about how cosmopolitan Livorno was. And it, that certainly did influence Modigliani because I would say he was uh, very cosmopolitan and had a world view in his art. Um, so uh, when he left, so he studied in Livorno and then uh, traveled around Italy. He did uh, kind of a grand tour in Italy. He went to Rome, he went to Naples, he went to, uh, studied in, in Florence, uh, not too far away, uh, studied in Venice and then uh, with a friend, made his way up to Paris, which was had become capital of the arts. Um, one of the reasons that Paris became so important is that there were a lot of venues or opportunities for artists to exhibit their art. There was um, the Grand Palais. There was the uh, uh, Salon Salon des Indépendants, Salon. Uh, uh, different types of salons and then dealers had, had, come, had started and had galleries in Paris. So there were a lot of exhibition opportunities and of course uh, artists always like to have their work seen. And uh, so these provided opportunities and promoted. And so there, this uh, became possible in Paris. And there was a great influx of foreigners, artists and otherwise people coming from the Eastern Bloc and, and all over, Japanese, uh, Americans. It was, it was a, a melting pot uh, in its own way. And uh, this added to the cosmopolitanism of, of the town. So whereas before, like in the 19th century, throughout Europe, there was a kind of a, a nationalist uh, trend uh, in society and politics and in the arts, um, so uh, for French academic artists, the 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 goal was to uh, uh, celebrate past French masters. So the, these new groups were were look, taking a wider view and trying to incorporate um, uh, different aspects into their art. Um, and uh, so, and that was an important element of modern art. 
So, uh, which actually, I, I mean, it's been lost over time, but at the time people referred to modern art as international art. So some critics, and that's a reflection of, of the sources for it. And of those artists, uh, you know, so there were, there was Chagall, uh, so many were Jews, Chagall, Pascal, uh, um, uh, there are dozens of Jewish artists uh, working in Paris. Chagall was kind of the most Jewish of the Jewish artists in the sense that he represented um, synagogues and floating rabbis and stars of David in his work. Modigliani was not, not like that. I mean, in some of his drawings, he makes references to references to Jewish culture, but it's not as overtly Jewish as, say, Chagall. Um, but he did consider himself, uh, Modigliani, to be a Jewish artist. His dealer and his main benefactor, Paul Alexander, said that he definitely considered himself to be a Jewish artist. Um, whatever that means, we don't know what that means. Uh, there wasn't much of a tradition um, before that generation the, the most leading uh, Jewish artist was uh, Pizarro, Camille Pizarro, um, but there weren't lots of Jewish artists like during Modigliani's time. So, uh, so he was kind of, you know, forging, uh, figuring out a new way for, for himself and for Jewish artists to exist. Um, he, would, he would introduce himself as Modigliani Jewish artist and uh, I think what he meant by that is he was trying to say that you could be an artist and be Jewish. Um, because like I said, it, it wasn't a given <laughs> that, that the two could coexist. Um, and uh, so there were competing different uh, styles at the time. There was Fauvism, which celebrated color. Uh, there was uh, led by Matisse, then Right afterwards, there was Cubism led by Picasso. They were kind of rivals. Uh, then there was uh, there were the Futurists who were an outgrowth of the um, of Cubism, uh, and they were basically Italian. Um, but some Russian Futurists uh, also developed a, a, a type of art. Um, then quickly there came a Dada, and then Surrealism in Paris, so there were all these movements and these artists uh, tried to recruit each other. They tried to recruit Modigliani actually, but he wasn't interested. He wanted to be his own person and have his own style. So he socialized with these artists. They all knew each other. They would hang out in the cafes in the first up on the hill and then down in Montparnasse in cafes which still exist today, uh, the uh, Café de la Rotonde, and uh, there's uh, so others, they have, they, they all make reference to their storied past when you, when you visit, but you can today eat in the same place that uh, Modigliani and Picasso ate uh, during their time. So the center of it in Montparnasse was an area called Carrefour Vervin, which means the Vavin intersection. And that was kind of ground zero. That was the, uh, within a hundred yards of Carrefour Vavin all the way around is where these artists lived. And so they lived in, in various studios. Um, and so they would work during the day under the sunlight. So they had skylights and, and had studios with that where light flooded in. And then at night they would socialize and uh, uh, with each other at these cafes. Uh, the cafes uh, courted the artists. They had they subscribed to newspapers from around the world to encourage artists to come and hang out and have a coffee and talk to each other. So that was an important part of the whole process. And in fact. Um, the cafe has really played a, an important and interesting role in the history of modernism. Uh, these cafes were literally the offices of, of these artists. So they would meet clients there, they would meet their dealers there, they would meet collectors there, and uh, 
they received mail there. There would be like a bulletin board with their with their mail because they moved around so much. They, the stable address would be the cafe, so they would have their cafe, and then a, a mail would be pinned to a, a bulletin board for them to collect or phone calls. I mean, artists didn't individually each have a phone that was just coming about at that time. Um, but uh, so if someone wanted to reach an artist, they, they could leave a message at a cafe and then the message would be written down and then put in a note on this board for them to get. So there was a whole kind of infrastructure, in, interesting one, there, which has been written about and studied. Uh, one person actually wrote a dissertation about a lot of these practices from the time, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, so it was a whole subculture and it um, played an important role in the development of, of modern art. So in Modigliani's case, he studied at various uh, um, uh, uh, academies in Montparnasse. So Montparnasse had different academies and uh, they uh, catered to foreigners and um, encouraged foreigners and gave scholarships to some foreigners. And so that was, uh, whereas the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was a little bit more French and resolutely French. And in fact, the, you know, there was early on, there was some tension that the French artists felt that the foreign artists were kind of taking over their, their space, their place and taking away scholarship money and opportunities. And that led to the development of these uh, different uh, academies. Um, so right on the, the street where Modigliani, Modigliani lived was uh, Academy La Grande Chaumière. He lived on uh, Avenue, Rue de La Grande Chaumière and there were a couple academies right there, and he studied there. He would go for uh, primarily for the um, the classes for the uh, you know to have live models uh, because for him obviously models uh, were very important because his art was very um, uh, much based on figuration, and so he would take advantage of these sessions where he could get, have pay a fee and have a, a live model to draw. And that's actually one of those is where he met what his girlfriend, um, Jean Ebutern, who became his most uh, uh, consistent model, let's say. Um, so he had various figures and girlfriends who uh, became his models, but uh, Jean Ebutern uh, was his last model. They lived together in a studio on Rue de la Grande Chaumière. She also became mother of, of his child. They had a child together. And uh, then um, she was actually pregnant with a second child um, when he died. And um, she ended up committing suicide. So the second child was not born. Um, and uh, so that was one of the many tragic stories surrounding his life and then also in Montparnasse. Um, and uh, so, so most of his art um, was created there in Montparnasse. Um, and uh, when he died, um, he was buried in, in Paris uh, uh, at the um, Père Lachaise Cemetery, which is reserved for famous people. And so, that gives an idea of his status at the time. Um, I personally feel that, you know, Modigliani was a big name pretty much from the beginning. He, people have tried to make him out to be the Van Gogh of his generation. Van Gogh sold one work of art during his lifetime and uh, died in some obscurity. And then quickly his work was discovered very soon after he died. Um, Van Gogh's work, uh, uh, you know, their dealers looked at it and weren't interested. Uh, even someone famous, famous like Ambrose Vollard was offered Van Gogh's estate or to be the representative of this, the estate and he wasn't interested. <laughs> uh, that quickly changed and, and Van Gogh became a superstar. With Modigliani, 
he uh, he got attention very quickly. He exhibited at one of the salons, and the way it worked at the time is that an artist their name would appear in the salon catalog and their address, uh, and then the works they were exhibiting. So if someone liked what they saw, they would then go visit the artist and buy directly from the artist in their studio. And uh, so Modigliani had uh, attention very quickly from Dr. Paul Alexander, who was a young doctor, didn't have a lot of money at the time, but Paul Alexander started buying up Modigliani's drawings. And um, he ended up acquiring close to 500 Modigliani drawings, um, which, uh, which was great support, uh, validation, great validation for Modigliani and, and great support. And then Paul Alexander also commissioned Modigliani at the time to make portraits of himself and his father and his family members so that was important in his life. These drawings um, have stayed in the family and are still largely within the Alexander family. And uh, so in the 1990s, an exhibition of the drawings uh, circulated uh, around the world, um, went to major cities, Venice, uh, Montreal, uh, and uh, other place did not come to the United States, interestingly, um, but a big fat catalog was produced in conjunction with the exhibition. That's still available. And they reproduced um, all of the drawings that the family that Paul Alexander had bought from Modigliani. So that's a very important record uh, for the Modigliani field, because since there, there has come to be a problem with fakes, it's very important to have a, a, a reliable, firm body of work that you can rely on. So uh, Paul Alexander's son, uh, Noel Alexander is the one uh, who helped make all this happen. He was uh, an historian, uh, an academic. So, and one thing that he did is he uh, arranged to be, for a little stamp to be made. So every drawing that was in the Alexander collection was stamped and numbered, and they have a, a you know, a record of all that just for posterity, um, and uh, so that's been very important. Uh, in auction houses today, when drawings come up for sale, uh, ones from the Alexander family uh, sell at a premium because of this this kind of guaranteed or validated history. Um, most are still in the family, but I think around 10% years. Because now we're down, you know, to grandchildren or great grandchildren, and so uh, so some have been sold off, and uh, and and pretty much in the major auction sales in London, in New York, there's there's always one or two of the Modigliani drawings from the Alexander collection in them. So, and they're a great record of Modigliani's achievement and they show what his interests were. Uh, he was, uh, he went to the Louvre all the time. He was a great student. He was a great student of art and art history. He went to the Louvre all the time. He loved the Egyptian section. So there's an Egyptian quality to some of his drawings and th those are very beautiful, quite beautiful. Um, he also, uh, there was a new museum that uh, exhibited uh, African and non-Western art. He went there regularly, as did Picasso and Matisse, and he incorporated those influences into his art. He was trying to rejuvenate. He wasn't trying to replace the Western pictorial tradition. He was trying to rejuvenate it by integrating these aspects into it to make it uh, for people to see these, the uh, to see things again. And uh, so that's one of the things that I love about his art. I, I've worked on it for over 30 years. I've never gotten bored because every time I look at his art, I see something new. I could tell that he was looking at oceanic art, African art, uh, uh, Italian primitivism, um, Botticelli, 
Leonardo. Uh, and so you can see uh, these influences in his art, the way he's incorporated them to make his own style. And so it's very exciting. Um, and uh, so he was kind of the quintessential cosmopolitan artist and uh, with all these sources and references and influences. And I think that's part of his popularity. People have asked, you know, why is he so popular? Well, um, because I think they're so rich. His images are so rich and uh, there's so much going on there. And I, I find it, you know, very interesting yeah, I, I like to go to all exhibitions and, and to auction previews. And uh, so I'll go to uh, one section where they have uh, works from the day sale, which are the ones which are not the most expensive. Um, and I'll see a, a Kisling nude uh, offered for $30,000. And then I go upstairs and see a Modigliani nude for $100 million. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what is it? Clearly Modigliani, uh, you know, touched a nerve. He, he incorporated something in his art that, that uh, it's not just me who sees it, but collectors and curators see it. I mean, every major museum wants to have a Modigliani painting, a Modigliani sculpture, a Modigliani drawing in it. So, and that's part of it also, that he was a triple threat in that, uh, some artists were just very strong in one area, in one medium, um, but he was uh, exceptional in three different media. Um, so painting, sculpture, and drawings. Uh, Brancusi was a spectacular sculptor. Some of his drawings are okay, um, but he didn't necessarily dabble in, in all the different art forms. And uh, so, um, and plus his story is very interesting in that, uh, you know, just uh, that um, he, you know, his background, his Jewish background, that that was kind of unique. And, and then um, I think that he knew he was going to die young. He was sickly most of his life. And so I think that pushed him to really achieve and to accomplish things and try to make his mark on the world. And uh, I, I don't think it was by accident. I think it was a conscious thing on his part. He really, I think he wanted to be a superstar. So he was definitely known during his life, uh, exhibited extensively. So when I started working on his art, um, I looked in various books and each book listed three or four exhibitions, but they weren't necessarily the same exhibition. So then I started gathering all that material and by the end, I had 18 exhibitions for his, uh, during his life. Um, and since then, I've found more. That's a lot. And again, these things don't happen. Exhibitions don't happen unless an artist and or their dealer really make it happen, make them happen. So I think he was very ambitious. Um, and uh, so when you have these exhibitions, and then I track down exhibition reviews and the catalogs to these shows, and then you learn even more about the artists and what they exhibited. Uh, he had one solo show during his lifetime. There have been a lot since then, but during his life, there was just one. And uh, at this gallery uh, run by uh, the dealer Bert Weil. And so um, that's a very important uh, exhibition, kind of legendary. Uh, it, her gallery was directly across the street from a police station and uh, she had some of his nudes in her window. <laughs> and they saw the nudes and they shut down the exhibition the day it opened. Um, actually what they did was they, they had her take down the nudes. So the exhibition still continued, but uh, it altered um, uh, what was exhibited. Uh, his nudes were very, uh, part of the reason they were so shocking is they were very contemporary. So before, like with Angla and other artists, nudes were, were very historicized. They referred back to ancient times or 
uh, and you know it, these women were wearing togas that were falling off and things like that. Moriani's nudes were very contemporary, I and mean, they could be your neighbor, or uh, so uh, that made them extra shocking. Um, the first person to do that, of course, was Manet, uh, and uh, so he made a, a, a couple uh, contemporary nudes, and then Modigliani really picked up on that and made it a central part of his art. So um, nudes are a big uh, category in his art, the, the highest, most valuable and expensive. Uh, then portraits of women, he clearly had away with women and portraying women. Then children, his portraits of children are very poignant. Uh, he loved children. And um, uh, so these are, he, he kind of ennobles them. He, he makes these large scale portraits of children and um, gives them a lot of presence and a lot of stature. And so that's part of why they're so appealing is that they're they're not just little waifs, um, but they are important figures that are portrayed on a level like politicians were or, or um, important people. And so, uh, and then the last category <laughs> are portraits of men. So the, in terms of desirability, now there are many incredible Modigliani portraits of men but in terms of the marketplace and collectors, they're not uh, as actively collected as the other categories. So it's a bit interesting to see that. So um, that doesn't mean the quality is not good. I mean, the paint handling is incredible and uh, the surfaces and, and all that. Uh, it's just, that's how his art has come to be seen by the marketplace uh, is in terms of these different categories. And um, so, uh, and so actually, well, I see my time has run over, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So there's a quick overview of Modigliani's art and how it's come to be seen and in interpreted. So, um, Christine, are, are you? you so much. I, I did have, um... If you could maybe explain what a catalogue raisonné is and how does yes. a painting go from somebody's living room wall to being included in a catalogue raisonné? Yes, so a catalogue raisonné is uh, technically a complete grouping of an artist's work. So the catalogue raisonnés are done on lots of artists, most artists. And so a scholar will decide to uh, focus on a particular artist and to make a catalog resume. I'm actually working on one myself. My, I have a subset of his, of his work, but um, so, and the way, the way it gets into the catalog resume, well, in my case, I can say I can only speak to my <laughs> particular circumstances, is that people will learn that you're doing a catalog resume and then they will submit their painting to you for consideration. So often these are done by uh, individuals who are working on the art. Uh, and um, in my case, I have a committee. I work with people, friends, uh, people I've known for decades, whose opinion I very much respect. And uh, so we'll look at the works in person. We also require um, a technical report be done. So, because there's been a lot of uh, scientific research done on Modigliani paintings um, as to, you know, what is in a Modigliani? So what type of red pigment is it, should be in a Modigliani um, or yellow or green or these different colors? So, so there, uh, there are very, a conservator will, will do that. There's one firm that I like to use because they've done so many uh, studies that they're very experienced in that area. And so when they, they write like a 40 or 50 page report and they say, we find this pigment in this painting as we do in all the, these other paintings. And uh, in some catalog resumes, actually many of them, there's no scientific work done. It, it's just 
what's known as connoisseurial work, where someone is just based on their eye saying, I have so much experience with this artist's work, I can tell just by looking. So um, that may be true, <laughs> but I personally uh, figure if we have the science, why not use it? So, uh, so we required that this report be done, which we read and um, so the, the, uh, I refer collectors to this, this person, uh, to this firm. It's a firm based in London, but they have a New York office. And so then the painting will be examined. It takes a, at least a month to get the report done. And then we, uh, we debate it. Um, one thing I have found, I mean, I learn enormous amounts. I mean, I know a fair amount. <laughs> But in each session that we do that, um, we learn a lot. Um, one thing that I found is that everything either quickly falls into place or it doesn't. Either there are a lot of positive signs or there are a lot of negative signs. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, you wanna see a certain brushstroke, you wanna see certain colors, uh, you wanna see a certain humanity. Uh, we looked at a painting recently and there was just an, an emptiness in the portrayal of the figure that it was just kind of, and, and we all agreed that there's no way that could be Modigliani because it's, it's so hollow and kind of empty. So um, that's not to say that Modigliani didn't make paintings that were off, uh, but um, for the most part, you know, there's a certain quality to them. Uh, now, interesting with Modigliani, because he's so popular, there are actually numerous catalog resumes, <laughs> which uh, um, have been done uh, or are being done. There are a couple being done. So um, the most respected is by an Italian named Cironi. Uh, and so um, he did various editions of his book of his catalog resume. The last one was done in 1972. Uh, and that, um, I think there are 337 paintings in that book. There are just small black and white thumbnail uh, images. That book uh, is um, used by curators when they're organizing exhibitions of Modigliani's work, by collectors, by auction houses. Um, but of course, that's not to say that it's 100% accurate or complete. Everyone pretty much agrees, including me and the people in my group, that uh, there are other paintings that should have been in Chironi. Chironi liked to see in person the works he included, and he never came to the United States, for example. Mm. So um, in my first meeting, uh, we looked at paintings from the United States that private collectors um, have, uh, and then, and we uh, evaluated them and we accepted six of them saying that these should have been in Chironi. And so they're now on my website where we say uh, these paintings are in our opinion uh, uh, by the artists. Um, so, and, and we're quite convinced. I have no doubt that the ones that we accepted that they're they're accurate and, and complete. And um, it's a challenging and fun process, enormously rewarding. Um, we do have to think about what we reveal. Um, there are certain things that we want to see in his work uh, that he did on a consistent basis. Um, they have been discussed in the scientific studies that are coming out. So in the academic uh, magazine, the Burlington Magazine, they did a series of articles about Modigliani. Uh, it's very technical. It's, it's hard to read, even for me, uh, but they do say things that they found. I, I don't like post on my website that we want to see these five things because then you're kind of giving a roadmap to, to fakers where if they say, oh, oh, well, I can add that to my painting. And uh, so, um, so there are things, there are little secrets, uh, things that should be there. And so if, if they're not in one of his paintings, it, it's, a, 
it's it's a red flag, you know, or uh, again certain brush strokes. He had certain he had certain um, things that he did, um, which uh, in a couple of cases like Cezanne did and Pizarro did. So uh, so we look for those telltale signs and um, when we're evaluating the art. Um, so there, there are definitely fakes out there. Um, some are easy to tell, because like I said, some are, have an empty quality to them, no humanity. Um, but uh, uh, one thing that I think I've come to believe, uh, or I'm starting to believe, is that actually many of these fakes were, came early. So they weren't necessarily from the 1950s or 1960s, but I think the fake, which makes it challenging because if you have references to a painting from 1924 or 25, I, mean, I used to believe that if you had like a 1925 reference to a painting, you were pretty safe. I don't know that I would say that today. So because there are paintings that uh, with early references that don't hold up and they don't, um, you know, pass certain tests. Clemence, I have a question for you. Um, it's now been a hundred years since Modigliani has died. Mm -hmm. and what do you attribute his popularity to? Um, so first of all, I think that forgery is a good index of uh, the popularity of a, of a painter. So the more uh, fakes, uh, the more it's saying something about the uh, about the painting themselves. I do think that, oh, by the way, I'm working on the catalog resume, which is going to be the competition to, uh, but we're friends, we're not uh, competitors. Uh, that's coming out next year. So just that also gives you uh, an idea of, of the, uh, the scholarly interest. Um, but the, um, so that notion that Modigliani was able to reach um, something that can be unconscious that speaks collectively to everyone. I mean, like the, the, the auction houses, um, it doesn't matter where the, the buyers are. I mean, some of the, um, of the paintings that reach uh, hundreds of millions actually were bought by Chinese uh, uh, art collectors. And so there is something which is really uh, universal uh, that is also uh, um, Modigliani's understanding of what um, that humanity is about. Humanity is not, you know, either going for sort of primitive art or, you know, the, the, the notion that you should choose between, um, you know, classical or um, uh, primitive inspirations is also something that he was very much, um, uh, that his art stands against, basically. And the, the very idea of West versus the East um, is something that completely, um, that his art uh, uh, completely uh, dismisses, right? And so I think that he's really capturing something which is the essence, something which is almost like transcends uh, the corporeality. And so even though the nudes, you know, as uh, Ken was saying, are the ones that sell better than the portraits, uh, the portraits of men, um, and there is something which is very carnal, uh, and you know, the, the flesh and the models. Uh, I think that he's able to reach. Uh, the, the, this, this humanity, something that really brings us together. And that is uh, also this metaphysical, ar metaphysical architecture that I was talking about. When it speaks to something which is almost, uh, that, that goes beyond the intellect. I mean, like the emotion that you were describing can also, like the idea that it never gets old, that it's always uh, renewed, always new, is something that you find. I mean, like epiphanies that don't get old, do they? I mean, poetry doesn't get old. And I think that there is almost a, this kind of revelation that Modigliani was able to uh, capture, the revelation of beauty, something that is, uh, and again, like you can really attribute this to uh, that can be Greek philosophy, that can be, but th this kind of ascent from the beautiful, I mean, it's very platonic as well, like from something that is beautiful that to something that is divine somehow, whatever you want to put under the word God or whatever you want to put under the word divine, there is something that is really um, otherworldly even in the flesh. And I think that this is this paradox um, that also makes M Modigliani's uh, endlessly mysterious and endlessly uh, fascinating. 
I, you know, the idea, and we, we talked a little bit, and this is something that the movie actually sort of um, emphasizes, I guess, a little too much. The idea that he was, uh, you know, um, this romantic uh, artist who died shortly before he was going to uh, make it, uh, his lover committing suicide, like there is this, almost the curse of the genius, right? Um, and, uh, and, and I think that somehow that it shortchanges Modigliani. I think that his work is more than the, his private life or that the myth somehow um, is, is anecdotal uh, when, when you're thinking about the, the importance of the work. I mean, myths are important because myths are the stories we tell. And I guess that also Modigliani's story is very compelling. I mean, people write and, and talk about Jeanne Buterin, who was actually an artist herself. And this is one of the tragedies, by the way, that her art was really interesting. Um, but that's, that's also something that I guess should be, I mean, she shouldn't be in the backseat, but that, that uh, makes Modigliani sometimes a little more trivial than what his arts uh, would be. There's something, you know, it's Kam Kamdinsky wrote about the spiritual aspect of art. And I do think that Modigliani's art is very spiritual. And that doesn't mean that, no, I mean, yeah, the, you have the Bad Veil exhibition that the nudes created this kind of outrage in this Puritan France of the early 20s, the, the, um, uh, the 10s and 20s. Um, but but I, I, I do think that you can uh, reach uh, the spiritual uh, through those very uh, corporeal presences. And that's also something which, uh, you know, Kabbalah and, and mysticism really talk a lot about. Um, so uh, again, and, and the idea that uh, things are, I mean, Modigliani's work is not about binaries. Modigliani's work is about creating this kind of unity of, of, uh, of presence, of aspects. Um, those elongated, uh, by the way, I was just looking at the chat so that I can make sure that people um, also have their answers, uh, um, answers to their questions. So those elongated shapes could be, you know, part of the Renaissance, uh, um, you know, the legacy of the Renaissance. But there is also something about, um, uh, again, this ascent that I was talking about, you can also say that in Kabbalah, the idea of the long face is one of the manifestation, the presence of the divine. Um, and, and to the question of whether there were um, actually, what's a smoking gun, you know, because its influences are really great. And it's just like, why scholars are in business, like, right, Ken, this is why we're still here, uh, as opposed to AI taking over our jobs. But the idea is that, um, uh, there is um, there are a few um, drawings that actually talk about alchemy uh, with uh, stars of David. I have um, you know if I can use um, another two minutes to have slides that I can show. Um, and he's also so I'm just going to share my uh, screen briefly. Um, and uh, he actually talks about um, alchemy. So that should be this is the beauty of Zoom, right? Just. I'm screen sharing. Okay, so that's the artist. In, in um, can you see? Yes. Okay, I, I'll try to go full screen. See, so after a year of of teaching on Zoom, there is almost always this kind of trepidation of like not being able to uh, pull it off. All right. So um, here you see those are uh, our um, alchemy uh, alchemy uh, symbols. You also have the Star of David here. Um, and what is he, what is writing also uh, Levit? So emptiness is looking for um, for fullness, and the fullness um, six emptiness. Those are um, also and what's above, and you know, so uh, as above, so below. Uh, those are part of alchemical treatises, but they're also part of Kabbalistic um, uh, books. And and the idea, oops, and the idea of uh, having to again uh, choose between alchemy and Kabbalah is something that is not was would not have been part of his Livonia's education. Um, alchemy, I mean, Kabbalists actually were uh, steeped in um, in alchemy because that that's this idea of transubstantiation, right? Just looking at those elements, something that is very of this world and being able to elevate them. So this is Adam, that, that's what I mentioned, the importance of the Adam who is um, the, the, the primordial human being. And uh, you can't see it, but there are fish. So that would be a Christian 
uh, symbol. And this is a moment in which he was also trying to, you know, breach the boundaries between uh, uh, um, um, uh, Christianity and Judaism, which, you know, if you're looking at Kabbalah as its primordial uh, faith, then, you know, those, those boundaries are no longer um, uh, uh, important. And this is also another one of, you know, Mercury, the Star of David, our with that could be or um, so that's light. Uh, and that is also talking about equilibrium through uh, opposites. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, but the coincidence of opposites is also <laughs> like it's Kabbalah 101. Um, so uh, yeah, again, like he never wrote a uh, hi, I mean, never, never introduced himself and said, hi, Modigliani Kabbalist. Uh, he would introduce himself as a hi, Modigliani, I'm Jewish because also he didn't fit really the, the cliche or the assumptions of what you know, a Jew would be like in Paris. People would imagine people you know, from Eastern Europe. Um, and he was this you know, Livornese uh, bourgeois looking uh, person. But, but, but I do think that um, uh, also hiding those influences is while revealing them is this kind of gesture that you find in any uh, mystical tradition. And that's, that's, those are traditions that he was uh, part of. Now, Sherry, did you want to pose some questions that audience members have presented? Yes, yes. And, and I'll back up a bit. There was a, an earlier question uh, for Ken. Uh, how did Mendigliani's uh, funeral and burial reflect his place in the Parisian art world of the early 1900s? And that's for Ken. Um, well, I would say the, the fact that he went uh, directly to Père Lachaise, uh, again, Père Lachaise is where famous people were buried. And uh, so he, you know, in the, following the Jewish tradition, he was buried within three days of his death and he was buried there. So it was an acknowledgement of, uh, of his place in history that he was buried there. Uh, it was attended, I write about this in my book, um, and yes, I see a little note at the bottom of the screen. Uh, his grave is not far from uh, Jim Morrison's grave, or I should say Jim Morrison's grave is not far from Modigliani, because obviously he would have been after Modigliani, but he's one of the legendary figures who, uh, another legendary figure who's buried at Père Lachaise. Um, so, uh, and so Modigliani's uh, funeral was attended by many important people. It's been written about, I record that in my book. So Picasso was there and Gertrude Stein and uh, Leger attended. And um, so uh, Hannah Orloff uh, was mm -hmm. there. So there were a large number of important artists uh, attended his funeral. There was a procession from, uh, from Montparnasse to Père Lachaise Cemetery, which is not close. It, that right, was yeah. quite a walk. Um, so, uh, so that's also a reflection of his importance that people would would, would make that that journey. So um, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. His his burial. Yes. Yeah, I, and then, I, oh, it was me. also sorry to add to this. He was someone who was also fascinating to uh, poets and and writers. So he was not he was not just attended by artists, which you know in of itself, as you're saying, speaks to his uh, to his importance. But he was also attended by people like Cocteau, Max Jacob, uh, and the first I mean, immediately after his death, or really shortly thereafter, Andre Salmon. All those people who were really uh, important names in the on the literary scene uh, started writing about it. So you know that. That's also how the myth came to be because you know leave a tragic life to writer and there you go right so it doesn't yeah. much Blaise Sandra, Sandra, uh, right. yeah so Blaise. you have you have a number of people who were um, who were part of his circles uh, and probably also had you know the same cafe where they would you know <laughs> yeah. yes so I wish even more had uh, you know, written about him. Um, his, one of his two main dealers was uh, Leopold Sporowski, who was actually had started as a 
uh, a literary a literature student. Um, so he was a writer and he was a poet himself. And yet he didn't leave a, a book or long essay about Modigliani, even though he saw him every day. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's like one of the, you know, there are all these tragedies <laughs> surrounding Modigliani's life. And for me, that's one of them is that, uh, that his, one of his closest associates, you know, didn't record, uh, you know, more about his life and his day-to-day -day actions and, and all that. Now, this question is a little more biographical as well. Uh, tell us what is known about Modigliani's Sephardic family and was there a possible connection to Spinoza? Was that ever proven? All right, so you want to I, pick that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the, you know, Everything Sephardi um, sort of, I guess, falls in my lap. But, uh, you know, can feel free to whatever, jump in. Um, so, yeah, his family. So, the, as I mentioned, the uh, community in Livorno was 100% um, Sephardi. Uh, some people were from Italy. Uh, originally, some were people who had been expelled from Spain. And this is why the Medici tried to make it this kind of magnet. Um, so, you know, Sef Sef Sephardi means literally from Spain. Um, and and his family was 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 part of this. Uh, the Garcin family, where the the Spinoza myth comes from, uh, was also a Sephardi family. Um, but then comes the question of Spinoza. I am really I hate to have to break the news that that was probably a family myth uh, because Spinoza's. Uh, uh, genealogy and his family tree really says otherwise. Um, but I, I, I think that it's also a tribute to uh, Modigliani's upbringing and the importance of his grandfather who um, taught him, uh, um, who actually instilled his passion for uh, literature and philosophy in him. Um, and so he was always reading, you know, the, the, the movie mentioned this. He was always reading Le Tremont. He could recite. Um, very well read, very well read, very. very extremely well read. Uh, uh, Dante's uh, um, uh, comedy. Um, and, and so that importance uh, and this very philosophical approach to. Um, to life, to art, but also to religion, was very much part of the of the environment in which he was. Uh, he grew up, and you know, again, sometimes uh, he was the, the the community in Livorno was Orthodox, but that Orthodox is really nothing like the one that we picture now, uh, where people would be really sort of trying to preserve a tradition, hang on to a tradition against modernity. This idea of, of orthodoxy as a way to actually embrace modernity because nothing is out of sight of the realm of religion, if you know, everything is, is God given, um, also uh, made it possible for people to be you know, completely sleep, uh, steeped in theology, but also in philosophy. And those things were not mutually exclusive. And this is what I was talking about when I said, you know, Modigliani really could not stand binaries. Uh, and this is not the way in which he was raised. And this is part of this humanist, uh, a kind of humanism of Sephardi culture that has, you know, dwindled a little bit. Uh, but that was really that, that kind of tradition from which, um, uh, his family came and that he came to, I think, represent in his paintings. Right. So uh, Spinoza did not have children. So he was not a direct descendant. And Spinoza's siblings did not have children. So he's a spiritual descendant of Spinoza, but not, <laughs> not, right. a, not yeah. a direct yeah. descendant of... Uh, and also the yeah. idea of, you know, God or nature, which is one of those, uh, th those questions that Spinoza's work uh, um, raise is, is something that Modigliani, I mean, in this kind of, you know, maybe pursuit of heresy as, as an artist would have been fascinated with. Uh, there's also, I mean, uh, uh, Spinoza was when, well, was, was a Kabbalist, so there is, there's also that. I mean, the presence of God in this world is something in which, you know, a lens through which you can also look at uh, arts. Mm -hmm. and, and that leads to part of another question. Um, did the Kabbalah influence his life directly? Was there concrete evidence that he lived his life in a way that reflected that? Right. Um, so, so um, as I, you know, the the slides that I showed was the evidence of uh, a sort of artistic influence. You don't really live your life. I mean, so first of all, Bonigliani um, would not have lived his life by Kabbalistic uh, rules unless you. Uh, 
counts intoxication as one of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is there is this aspect to his life, the idea of you know what kind of uh, forbidden paradises or. Um, he was very much part of this culture, you know, Mac Jacob, Cocteau, you know, opium and, and all kind of excess, uh, you know, whether that's a pathway to altered state of consciousness and visions, uh, I'm not here to discuss here and I'm not uh, proficient in that matter. Uh, but, th but there is, there is certainly uh, that um, sort of the idea of how do you get to those visions. Um, but no, I mean, he was not, he was more of this uh, kind of cultural Jew, right? That uh, rather than um, an observance, I mean, he was also like in this Livorno sound, maybe a Kippur Jew, we don't know at all. Um, and also his Judaism was something that we- What do you mean by a young Kippur Jew? Well, people who fast and were good to synagogue on, on oh, Yom Kippur, and then you, you, you wouldn't catch them anywhere near <laughs> uh, the rest of the year. Uh, just, you know, like atone for your sins and then, you know, let God deal and with then it. You're good for, <laughs> then you're good for the year. You're good right. for the year. Um, you know, you're, you're inscribed in the book of life and then, you know, um, but, but this, this is also something that uh, is, is pretty much part of this, you know, Yvornia's you know, the, the, the rabbis there call it this holy apathy <laughs> or this kind of indifference. Um, and and um, yeah, so, I mean, Kabbalah as a practice uh, would entail being part of, you know, um, sort of circles and that's not something that he was part of. But neither was he, I mean, he sort of attended some uh, seance the, of, of spiritism and, and he actually drew a painting of one of those people, I mean, a woman and, and another man. Um, but it doesn't, so first of all, the, the, the characters seem to be very stern. So like really far for having received the kind of illumination. Um, and that's early in his life. We know from his mother's diary that he also attended such uh, seance um, in Venice. Um, but, but that's, that's the extent of his, uh, of his dabbling in it. He, he did have, uh, he mentions Max, Max Jacobs, the, the poet, and was one of his best friends, um, having had this kind of night uh, in, Mar in, in, in 1916. Um, so again, like we, we don't know, except that all we know is that Max Jacob was fascinated with the Zohar, so one of the books of Kabbalah, but Max Jacob had converted to Christianity. Um, so that's, um, I mean, and, and the sort of the way but in which- But he died a Jew, didn't he? Uh, well, he died, he died, unfortunately, after being rounded up um, in, in Bonne la Rolande, so in 1942. So yeah, he, he died uh, a Jew by, you know, Nazi stand, or like that, that's, that's where he, um, that, that's how he, he passed. And, and then Picasso tried to intervene, by the way, but that was already too late being uh, taken. So, and as we know, conversion didn't, uh, didn't do anything for uh, people who were um, uh, marked as, as, as Jewish. Um, but yeah, but, but in any case, Mike Jacob was fascinated by Kabbalah and so were a number of people who were um, also Christian. So that's this kind of very, um, you know, turn of the century fascination for what was the cult. Uh, but but uh, Modigliani had a different grasp on those materials because you know this kind of occultism can be a very bit of a mishmashic <laughs> uh, uh, sort of aspect and 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 that's not something that uh, Modigliani uh, you know uh, fell for. And let this me mention question... also about when... go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to add a little bit to the uh, to the idea that that he smoked hashish and also. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, also been suggested that he did that well, as a thing. Is it since me? he did that? You know, I'm sorry, Ken, but you're that's possible. Also. I don't know if I'm, yeah, we're, we're having doing we're something like a. It's it. We're losing you. I don't know if that's my computer, but you you go go in and out. So okay. Well, we'll move to the next question. Um, 
What happened to the surviving child, the first child that Modigliani had? Do you want to, Ken, do you want to go for it? Yes. Uh, so she did. Uh, she was raised by her Italian family uh, back in Italy, um, in uh, Florence, and I think maybe Livorno. Mm -hmm. And um, so she became an art historian uh, and an artist herself. Uh, she wrote a book on Van Gogh, interestingly, um, and uh, then she lived in Paris. She lived until 1984, I believe. Uh, she had a daughter, so that would be Modigliani's granddaughter, uh, who lives in Paris. I know her. Uh, she's a professional. She's a um, psychologist. And uh, so, uh, so the family line has continued. And then she herself had a daughter. So... Yeah, to add to this, what's really interesting is that she, you know, eventually after years of avoiding and working on, you know, parallel tracks and other artists, she did write a book called Modigliani, The Man and the Myth, uh, in which- Right, this is the daughter. The daughter did end up writing a book about her father. Right, so yeah. Jeanne. And so what is really interesting is that she's talking about, I mean, she in the book, she really describes how in the family, people would talk about, you know, il poverino, the poor Monigliani. And so she was raised in this kind of cult or like worshiping her father, but also in that kind of silence, which might explain why she, she sort of, you know, tiptoed towards the, the great man, but was still at a distance. I mean, this is, as you say, it's like fascinating that she chose to write on Van Gogh um, and, and then really later in life, I think the book is 1975 or something that she, she wrote. And this is also where we, we have a few um, insights into how the family uh, responded and, and this life in Livorno, because yeah, they, you know, she her mother committed suicide shortly after her father's death. And so they, they took her back in um, and she was raised uh, an Italian uh, young woman. Right. And so the yeah. uh, last question is um, dealing with Paul Alexander that he collected only drawings and not any other form of Modigliani's art. Do we know why? And um, are the drawings widely distributed? Well, he did um, commission some paintings. So there, in fact, one came up at auction recently. So of himself and of other family members. Um, I would imagine the reason that he concentrated on the drawings versus other media were financial reasons. He was not, you know, he was a young doctor. He had just gotten out of medical school, so he didn't have a lot of money. So I, th and I think he liked drawing. So, uh, so that's so he focused uh, on the drawings and um, as I said they've been recorded there's a whole book called the unknown Modigliani mm -hmm. um, and appeared in various languages where so the almost 500 drawings that were owned by Paul Alexander are recorded and preserved uh, visually in that book. Still get it you know on I think even on Amazon or something like that. So, um, and uh, as I said, the, the drawings uh, are still for the most part in the family, not necessarily in the, with one person. I think they're maybe dispersed within the family, but um, uh, so they're still known. They appear in exhibitions, they appear at auction and things like that. And was there any truth to the thought that he may have had a statism? A what? A stigmatism a what? that some of the ways he, he oh. drew may be uh, related to that. The elongated shapes would be a result of, of stigmatism. Uh, I yeah. don't think so. No, you know, that, that comes out of, uh, well, in part what you talked about, the Kabbalah, I think, but also African art. You know, African right. masks are very long elongated, the noses are elongated, I, there, there's have little button mouths and stuff. So I think that whole style was something he appropriated from African art to, mm -hmm. to add a mysterious element to, to his portrayals. And that and also the, the caryatids and the, uh, and the Egyptian art that, you know, he had, uh, as the, the, the movie touches upon, um, uh, the, this 
affair, or at least this uh, relationship with Anach Matova, who was this, you know, fabulous, another, you know, poet who was drawn by Modigliani. And so she, he also, I mean, he painted her with her, those very elongated uh, neck and, and very, um, you know, lengthy, long, long uh, features. And, and I think that, again, like this is this, you know, bringing together all those um, traditions uh, is the reason why he, he expressed himself um, like this. Well, thank you both, Ken and Clemence. I'm gonna turn this back over to Christine for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, those presentations were fabulous and I, I've learned so much in such a short period of time. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and for the audience to have joined us. Um, I'm just curious whether either Clemence or Ken want to make any uh, closing remarks? Well, I just wanted to thank you all for the invitation and for being here today and um, hoping that there will be uh, more in-person events soon, but that was one of the silver linings of the times that we're going through. So stay safe, everyone, is the final word, I guess. Yes, thank you. and. Uh... Uh, I do think that the documentary is very good, and uh, so I hope that all the uh, that everyone has seen it. Um, there's another one. There are two actually that came out this past year. That being one of them. Um, this last year was the hundredth anniversary of his passing. He died in 1920, so that's part of the reason why there's been all this attention. And uh, I hope it continues, and I'm sure it will for many years so all right yes thank you for the invitation thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the festival thank you. all right thank you <laughs>